out and uh, they like, ask somebody else. I don't remember. So Sabi, if you could uh, moderate this panel as well. Yeah, okay, too, yeah. Yes, please. <laughs> you, were, you did a good job. You have been a mistake. <laughs> Okay, and so I can reverse that. Yes, yes, good. Uh, so the point, this is an LSST conference, but I think the, the point of talking about other projects is that some of the science goals that we may pursue with LSST may actually happen before we get there or alternatively. So I think it's important that we have an idea of uh, uh, what else is out there, what else we are expecting. So the um, ideal discussion would be about what may happen uh, from the science goals that we one for LSSD, even before it happens, so we can, or have to focus on other things. Sabi. So, you said that too? <laughs> Actually, I was hoping that maybe Chad, I didn't uh, ask you before, but would you like to say a few words about the Iman uh, thing? Oh, that's going to yeah. be very relevant, and you're the representative here. Right. And then uh, there are more chairs, so I'm, I'm afraid I, I will have to stand here. Totally. The days of chat. Go. Totally. <laughs> 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 Sorry, okay. that was a lame excuse. <laughs> somebody, I'll have to be here for the slides at least. So oh, I'll I just push it. Don't no, no, it ha you have to change it, and it, and Monsi wants to see them, so it's very complicated. I have to stand here. I'll okay. sit down once. Okay, anyway, then you, you talk there. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so so why why do we need other projects at all? <laughs> why do we need Amo? Why? I think we just need LSFC. We don't even need LIGO. Okay. <laughs> no. Um, uh, well, I, well, I mean, you mean other than LSSC and LIGO, is that the scope? Yes. Yeah, so, so what is what what is the what is the gain what you have uh, for for end level interaction? Yeah. So yeah. instead of pairwise interaction, yeah. yeah. So Amon is Amon is proposing uh, any degree of interaction. So yeah. maybe you can even introduce Amon because maybe people don't know. Yes, there's an effort at Penn State um, to basically do multi messenger astrophysics and astronomy by doing N way correlations with observatories that sign on. Um, and it's it's kind of just getting started, but um, the idea is you know that we try to do multi wavelength and also not only EM but neutrinos and other particles as well. Um, I think it's I, I, I imagine it's pretty obvious with LIGO and, and LSST you've got optical and gravitational wave, but we, we've already heard X-ray is critical, gamma ray, all these other things. So ideally we'd want to map out, and possibly neutrino depending on the system, we'd want to map out literally every single wavelength that we could possibly get our hands on. Um, because I think that's presumably how we're going to ultimately figure out. That's going to be our best insight into any potential microphysics, I would guess, to go along with the bulk dynamics that we learned from gravitational waves. So, I think that's the motivation. Hopefully, that's enough at least to get the conversation. Yeah. Michael. Yeah. So, I sort of took this question as to what can we learn with the surveys that we have now. Um, so, there's, uh, in my mind, uh, so in the optical, there's the uh, Deckham team led by Vito. Uh, there's, of course, PTF of Monsi, you know, and all, of course, then the PanStars team, which I'm involved in. And so I think there's a number of things that we do well and a number of things that we still don't know how to do and which should be solved by the time, or we'd like to have solved by the time analysis is around. So, for example, in terms of using these models that we've heard about, I think the, the deck cam team does well in terms of making color cuts uh, when they put out transients for Kilonovi. Uh, Z and I, and how exactly they use the fact that they take uh, data in all of their filters. Uh, PTF's taken uh, another tactic where they follow up uh, these very short time scale blue things and sort of using what we think we know about the models uh, to select transients and drag down background. There's a lot of work that's gone into optimal tiling strategies and how to. Uh, and, and just beginning to how to incorporate the distance information that um, LIGO is putting out now. Of course, with I think everyone knows about Leo's paper, um, but I, what I don't think happens is how is that people um, where our groups are have optimized how to scale any sort of, uh, if I'm going to look at some direction on the sky, should I be taking more exposures in that direction dependent on um, the distance information that's provided by Leo. Uh, finally, uh, uh, yes, my paper says you should. So yeah, no, no, <laughs> I, I know it says you should, but in terms of you know, 
code or actually doing it where you, you know, we're actually doing the scalings is appropriate. I mean, it's hard to do. So. And then finally, uh, we, the, everyone keeps mentioning this needle and haystack problem, and uh, we've already seen multiple, uh, multiple papers have talked about how there are transients we found in the surveys from the follow-up of the first two events which if we didn't, hadn't seen them in some other survey before, and so in the case of uh, DES, there, there was a PanStars, uh, we were lucky to have seen it in PanStars before, otherwise we might be having a different conversation. Um, but basically, how to generate, put together a formalism to actually do the, the appropriate background uh, studies with LSST, which will be even more difficult than it is now. Um, I, none, I don't believe any of that's been solved, at least so far, by the teams, any of the teams I know. So these are sort of the open questions we can continue to solve with DES, PTF, Atlas, so on and so forth, um, before else is ready, because I don't think we're ready to do that yet. Can I add something to this last point, which is my, my concern raised earlier, that if, if the first TO we do is on a LIGO event, we're not going to have any idea what the background is for that cadence and for that. So I'm wondering if some of the TOO choices could be motivated or informed by some of these deep drilling fields Tony discussed, or other things, or, or by these other types of surveys, of course. But I'm wondering if, I mean, because before that point, you know, we might not have any idea about what a fast cadence at that depth will actually give us. <laughs> and in turn, of course, we can always do the exercise after, but then we will have a time cost. We've lost the ability to do the follow-ups of the events. So I, I think there should be some effort into not just what TLO strategy we do, but understanding specifically for that strategy what our background would be. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe that can be combined in an optimal way with the deep drilling strategy. I'm just thinking about it. So, so, so yeah, and, uh, and Julie Tony want, has, and Julie, and Julie has something. Too. Oh, so, Julie, so do you still want to say something? Oh, I, I mean, I will when I turn it You will, okay. Words, it's fine. So, okay, so. So, um, um, yeah, so it's for this reason that we have decided to do a deep drilling field from day zero. And so even without having covered the sky once, uh, we are going to, well, we're going to have the main zero star, but we're also going to be doing a deep drilling field at day zero. And so that will be in the can uh, at the end of six months. So we'll learn a lot. What was the decision based on where you're doing it? What directions? It's going to be in a well steady field. Okay. Probably Chandler. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, I've got a, a slightly um, different question. Everything we've discussed so far is, uh, is focusing on you know how to find the needle in the haystack and how to maximize our probability of making a detection. Uh, but there's another aspect to um, uh, coordinating observa observations, and that's the in the more optimistic uh, scenario that we're routinely detecting uh, counterparts. And in that case, um, let's say LSST was. Um, you know, fairly regularly picking up uh, counterparts, what would we want to do then? I mean, how do we, scientifically, what would we learn, for example, by comparing LSST and W-first observations? Um, what specifically would we want to follow up with uh, LSST uh, observations themselves, um, not to make confirmations, but from the from a, a physics perspective, to actually learn more about the, about the, about the killer number? I mean, I think I've seen the kind of plots that would, um, uh, suggest what you might want to do, but I'm not sure that I've heard anybody explicitly say, um, you know, in uh, an observation-rich environment, what are the sets of observations that would be most useful for nailing down um, the physics yeah. of, of killing What went fair? Maybe that's... Yeah, well, I would say um, if JWST was still around, then it, getting a mid-infrared spectrum would be really useful in composition of exactly what the composition of the material is. Um, Let's see, yeah, having temporal evolution from W first or some near infrared facility, getting a beautiful, well sampled telenova light curve can tell you about um, the ejected mass, velocity, things like that. And also the you know, having the off axis afterglow information from the X rays or radio could tell you um, you know, what the opening angle of the jet is, or at least the observer angle. Um, so those are kind of in the dream world that would be the, the types of observations and uh, things that we would be looking for. Brian, what would you want to learn? Like, 
two on the back. I really I think when Frank covered it pretty well. I mean, maybe Jay Bruce T will be around, or maybe a 30 meter telescope will be around. But it would be really amazing not just to see the light curves, but you know, as this thing is fading, as we're seeing deeper into the silver parts of the ejective to get a spectrum and see these weird absorption lines from these these, these elements we've never seen produced in nature before. To me, that that confirmation would be would be really uh, exciting. Um, and then also, you know, if we re detect the redshift, we have the gravitational waves. If we break that degeneracy, we know the viewing angle. And as Wednesday said, you know, we'll see, we see an afterglow that does some behavior, and then that we can test the Andrews models for how that works. So, yeah, to me, that's, that's yeah, very exciting. Or, or you know, see, see X-rays or see radio emission. See X-rays. The graviton? Okay. Talking about X-rays, talking about Japanese X-rays. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, from, I think that's what we're talking about. Yeah, I want to talk about some uh, Japanese X-ray or sky monitoring. Go to the second, second. Uh, yeah, I want to show you the coincident observation of the, 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 the gravitational wave again. <coughs> Uh, we are operating the maximum amount of all sky x ray, uh, the board ISS created by RIKEN and the Japanese Space Agency, and that have a, uh, that have a very small field of view, uh, 160 degrees by 3 degrees, and uh, that covers only two. percent of the all sky at any moment. And, uh, but the, 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 the field of view is uh, gradually scanning the whole sky, and uh, uh, we can cover 80% of the whole sky in 90 minutes. And uh, the, the localization power is about 1 degrees, and we already performed the, the, the counterpart search for the gravitational wave event, and uh, uh, as you know, we, yeah, the, the, the result is negative, but uh, we set the, some uh, three sigma limit like this. And uh, the important point is uh, that we have uh, actively working X-ray or sky monitor. And the uh, X-ray sky is very, very sparse. So uh, probably uh, it's the very the, the powerful and easiest way to detect the EM counter. Go to the next slide, please. And I just calculate the, the, the localization probability of the gravitational wave events in X-ray. Uh, it is not so huge just less than 10 percent and uh, that we are operating uh, the, the three uh, all span monitor uh, satellite uh, swift and maxi and uh, evis on board in Zebra. and uh, they have a very small uh, not small but few, uh, about one 1.4 radian field of view for swift and uh, maxi is 0.25 radian uh, field of view and uh, when we uh, Taking into account this kind of uh, uh, the parameter, we can uh, calculate the localization probability. And the Swift is 8, 9, 8.9 percent, and Maxi is just 0.8 percent, and Integral is uh, less than 0.5 percent, 0.2 percent. And uh, um, we sometimes, uh, sorry, <laughs> it is kind of a presentation, but uh, uh, hopefully we can detect uh, the, uh, the soft, soft X-ray axis uh, just coincident with uh, the short gamma reverse, like this. And if we can detect this kind of short uh, soft axis, uh, the, the, the detection localization probability is going up for maxi, because the maxi can localize a very low energy. Uh, lower, less than <coughs> 10 kV energy band, so uh, the localization probability is going up to 6.4 percent. And uh, but is that assuming that the extended emission is isotropic, or is it? Uh, is it, is it uh, yeah, it right? depends on the yeah. It strongly depends on the, the assumption that the, uh, we just. Uh, mm -hmm. Fifty percent of short gamma rays have right. been yeah. 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 I realize those, those are the ones that are pointed at you because presumably yeah. after a hundred seconds they're still beamed, right? Well, well, you don't know what that excess emission yeah. is. So, <laughs> I mean, we we, 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 
Yeah, we don't know what it could, it, it could be. But you're assuming, sorry, in your race, you're assuming that it's uh, that it's just it's, that it's beamed as well as the camera. Okay, okay so you, I, I, I want to summarize my uh, presentation and uh, the X-ray observation is very powerful to localize the gravitational wave event, but uh, need more field of view. Uh, we only cover uh, some fraction of the, uh, the sky, so uh, already preserved tension. We need a very wide field of your sky motor vision. Should, uh, should be realized in 2020. So it's worth commenting that the gamma ray sky is even more sparse. Uh, and our instruments have larger fields of view. Um, short gamma ray bursts peak in the gamma ray. Um, but, but in gamma ray region, we yeah. cannot detect this kind of soft axis. Soft axis duration, the soft axis event is more than 100 seconds. That is very good for. Oh, for so, um, I mean. Are you saying that in 50% of short gamma ray bursts that are observed I'm, I'm now sure, that we I'm see? I'm sure. Oh, I mean, because we have uh, XRT observations in principle. No, it's more like 15% mm -hmm. yeah, of the detected the, with burst has been emission. There was an analysis by Linnell or something that suggested yeah. that it's consistent. You, you could hide up to Norris maybe, Norris and Benel, that up to 50% up to could contain it. We wouldn't be able to detect it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm not um, questioning the, the value of, of X-ray observations, but I don't think we should ignore that, um, that their gamma rays do occupy um, something of, of a unique spot with the significant disadvantage that we're really only able to see uh, gamma ray emission from the beamed uh, part of, um, uh, sure. of, a, of a short gamma ray burst, but they're, they're quite dim. Um, the afterglow is quite dim at the, at the time that it that you, it breaks out of the uh, out of the jet, so it's still challenging. So basically, uh, what we are proposing is um, a trigger from gamma ray transient detectors that will then uh, lead to repointing of the North Sky Monitor to actually observe the afterglow, regardless of the tail or anything, the afterglow of short gamma ray bursts. And we know we have folded into the into this configuration the actual um, um, beaming. We also have folded the actual intensity of the afterglow. So as the time passes, the um, the mission we're proposing, which we still don't know, except that's why I'm not presenting it actually. We'll have a four degree per second uh, slowing rate, so we'll be there very fast, and we'll be able to at least observe two of them per year. And we're talking about the afterglow in the X-rays. We have a field of view 365 degrees so square. So basically, we will be able to locate it with one accuracy. And then we can raster any field of view that you guys are observing, depending on how many detectors are active at that time. Anticipated launch is 2021, assuming it has been approved. We'll know June July. Ask question. Of course. Uh, sorry, I, I got confused during some of the discussion. Is the is it the case that we believe X ray are X rays are as beamed as the gamma rays for the for this immediate emission, or we don't believe that, or we don't know? My understanding is if the if the um, you know, while the jet is still relativistic, um, while the emission in the jet is still relativistic, you've got a relativistic uh, beaming, so it doesn't. I mean, you yeah. can't start to, yeah, yes. uh, to see things until 1 over gamma allows you to see things at a larger angle, at which point you're at that gamma part of the, of the afterglow. I mean, somebody else possibly... Yes, yes. basically, we're not looking from the mission, we're looking in the afterglow. But this is not an emission. I think this is My terminology might have been wrong. My terminology might have been wrong. I guess I'm talking about this extended emission. Yeah. But the we question don't, is, so, 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 so there's the, the gamma burst itself it yeah. clearly beamed. This gamma burst makes a, an afterglow, which is also not nearly as beamed as the gamma burst. This hump doesn't fit into our afterglow models. So we don't actually know if that is a part of the same jet or, for instance, Daniel discussed like a magnetar might produce something more isotropic. And it's not as soft as the X ray after. Right, right, right. So that's distinct. So, so, yes. so I say we, we don't know that there there could be a, a luminous isotropic X-ray component, but um, 
Yeah. We don't know. We do know that there's a security guard. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, well, you're basing it on the security. Yes, on the security amount. Let, let's, let's put it this way. What you're looking there is not what this mission that I'm describing is sure. going to be looking for. Right. You're Completely unrelated. Exactly. Okay. okay. Good. But the question, I, the reason I asked that is that, I mean, is there an expectation that without the gamma ray burst being the initial thing, that a gravitational wave alone could see X-ray because it's less beam? Because, I mean, some people suggested, but the thing that it's an extended mission really has to repeat, and since uh, it's already contradicted. Okay. We don't, if you read through the data simply, I think that if you look at the, you know, bad, like, you know, imaging the same, you know, of our radius, it seems that uh, we, we have... Well, it would look like, well, it would right. look like a, a gamma, a long gamma yeah. burst, though. So, the, I mean, all of them. I'm talking about all of them. No, you know, we're not talking about the If you have the, you know, the... the, the if you the, just had the extended mission without... Yeah, yes, yes, yes. All the, all the mergers have the, you know, the... Yeah. How would we know from okay, that? Okay, so, so it, it seems that there is a group who has to have a lunch together. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tzvi, you had a, you had a note? Yeah, my, my guess is that uh, one can rule out on energetics and uh, from uh, extra observations that this signal is, uh, is isotopic. But it's a guess. I, I, did, it's, uh, I, I never imagined it to be isotopic, but I didn't do a calculation on the top of my head. And, and I agree, it's probably not bad. But yeah. my guess is that uh, it, it, it will be yeah. safer to be, to, get, to assume that this X-ray emission is also being in this more or less the same way as the, the afterthought. But this is something that can be, should be worked out. But we're not worried about uh, it. No, I know that your mission is not... Uh, it may be yeah. confusing, but yeah. we're following this pipe there. We have an original location, and then we repoint and we follow a different part of the event, nothing to do with the tail. This is above 10 kV, we're between 0.3 and 5 kV, so we're much below, much softer emission. And that emission is the canonical to be wished afterglow of the burst, yeah. short or long. And there we know what the trend is from a statistical sample of short gamma ray bursts of their afterglows. And we know the sensitivity of our instrument, we know the intensity of these afterglows, we know how long it would take us to go there and look, and that's how we actually calculate how many we expect to see, which is two per year in the worst case. Okay. Is that clear? Yes. Perfect. So, so before I have a really controversial question, so let's continue with the panel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I gave you a slide and just, I forgot what I wrote on it. <laughs> so, yeah, I think I, I talked a bit about in the context of what else we can do um, before, during, advanced uh, or LSST. Oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, one thing is, of course, Michael um, you know, outlined this very well, but we can learn a lot from kind of current and upcoming surveys with prior to LSST, such as ETF. Um, I think we'll understand kind of our blue background a lot better, um, you know, than, they, than, than current surveys. Uh, the dark energy survey, and also, um, you know, the radio, the VLA sky survey might potentially be helpful in terms of long-term radio transients if we want to go that route. Um, that, yeah, I think it's important to underscore the role of kind of future or planned high energy missions and how LSST and LIGO could fit into this picture. Raphael is talking about that more, and there's more uh, talks about that. I think one thing that hasn't really been discussed as much that I've been thinking about is kind of using information from host galaxies. So. Uh, there's a number of 17,000 galaxies per square degree in the LSST footprint, but how many of those are, you know, uh, from the typical host galaxies that we would expect mergers to be? So L star um, galaxies are brighter, so probably the majority of that 17,000 number is at the low mass in the end. Um, so I think, and also in, in, you know, LSST's normal survey for this 10 million transient alerts per night, or how many transient alerts per night, um, I think it's also important to use host galaxy information and what we know about, for instance, tidal disruption events. We know they they preferentially prefer post-starburst galaxies and their nuclear. So how can we leverage that information to kind of assign a probability that an LCC transient is a TDE, for instance? Um, kind of off tangentially related, but I think work can be done in that area. Um, and this is kind of another uh, question I, I basically had to the LIGO people is, um, how well, will, how well and how quickly will you know 
whether something's a binary neutron star versus a neutron star um, with a low mass black hole. Um, and, low mass. And, what? How low mass? Three solar masses? Or? Yeah, like three solar masses. Like something that can be. We hope there's nothing like that. It makes it complicated. <laughs> yes. It's, it's easy, even though it even made it. Can I ask in some sense, what does it matter? Just in some sense, that I, I think the low mass black holes will be the ones that have the neutron stars. So, uh, I mean, they both could be candidates for. Right. So, yeah. So. I'm just wondering in the context of uh, trying to compare the rates of those things versus short gamma ray bursts and trying to understand. You know what is the actual progenitor channel for short term bees? Um, we can't start each other as we can start black holes. Chad, you probably have an answer for that. I think three solar masses would be tough. Yeah. Like, <laughs> how about five? Five, yeah. five is a little easier. Ten. Ten is a lot easier. <laughs> but then, with them with ten, it may not have a Yeah. Right. Right. Because because the point is is that the ten solar mass black hole looks awfully big to that little neutron star, so it kind of just falls right in. So you'd be pre pretty promptly be able to say this is potentially in right or probably not. Well, there the yeah, there's been some great work on that. People have like worked out under what equations of you know state can you reasonably plausibly disrupt the neutron star, and we've got this post hoc thing that you know, I don't know, that sounds disparaging. Like it's a very good calculation based on what we observe with these maximum likelihood estimates of masses and things, we sort of grind it through that and then get an estimate of whether or not it's likely to be a neutron star. Best case scenario, we do full PE from step one, and we have all the information we could possibly give you with all the physics. <coughs> I think we're all going to push towards that. Whether or not that happens by 2022 or 2032, I don't know, but we'll try to do as much as possible at the moment. But fundamentally, for low SNR, if, if we have stuff in the mass gap, it's going to be hard to tell that it's tough. NSBH versus an NSX. So how about the, how fast you can determine the speed parameter? Because how does the disruption quite depends on the speed parameter? It, it does, and that gets folded into the current calculation. Is that the case? Because we do estimate the Z component of the spin as, as part of our instantaneous point estimate. And that's the primary component that matters for tidal disruption. It is. The misaligned component is much less important. Yeah, so so we do have a point estimate for that. Maybe LE wants to say. Yeah, I just want to add one more data point. That in most of these estimates, uh, they are just assuming what's a circular orbit. And Pretorius and Lena have a paper where they show that if you get a lot of ejecta, then you have a mildly eccentric orbit. So uh, we don't have estimates for that. We don't know what the relation is to the mass ratio, spin, and eccentricity. But if we are uh, really fortunate, we could see one of these events, you will see tidal disruption, then you will see a flare. So it would be great if we could be ready for that scenario. We don't know what it will be get DNS, and then SPH could be a possibility. And the value to the project could be a really nice year. I mean, so one possibility would be that my DNS really are vanilla 1.35, 1.35 plus minus 0 0.04, and like in that case, if like all DNS looks like that, as soon as you get something that doesn't look like that, you might say, oh, that's that's but if, if you allow the neutron stars to be anywhere in the canonical mass range, it's incredible. So, so since John von Neumann was Hungarian, so let me play a little game theory here. So, so assume that 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 you know LSST will solve this problem because in every few days we will image the full sky. Yeah, but until then, we do not have enough telescopes to image the full error region. So, if we give an error region to everybody then everybody will jump on the 99.9% .9 region and image it 70 times, yeah? And the rest doesn't get image. <coughs> this is the extreme situation, yeah? So, so the other situation is that we take a computer and we don't tell anybody what is the error region and assign everybody a little slip and people have to put together the puzzle. So that's really nasty. So, but who can we leverage between these two extremes? Yeah? One ensures full coverage, the other uh, gives full freedom. Who can we get full freedom and full coverage? <laughs> 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 so, I consider, so we have to solve the same problem um, in Fermi with um, wanting to get um, a large number of stars to be um, The community knew that there were a small handful of pulsars that were kind of guaranteed to give um, interesting results, but you know we needed all of them to be timed so that you could uh, look for a gamma ray signature from uh, from them all. 
and um, well, I, I mean, I don't think that it would work for the uh, optical gravitational wave follow-up community. What we did was uh, ask the pulsar observing community to self-organize, and they formed uh, an MOU that essentially made sure that all of the pulsars were that MOU then joined any resulting paper regardless of whose observations <coughs> actually made the, made the, the discovery. I mean, in principle, if the community was willing to self-organize, you could do the same thing here. Like you could come, you could come to an, an agreement that you know, collectively with the suite of telescopes you cover the area. Um, do you know what their algorithm was? The community isn't, I mean, the radio community, I think, is sort of works in a slightly more collaborative mode. I, that sounds more critical than I, than I intended. Um, I mean, they're just used to working in that much. Thank you very much. That's 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 utopistic. Uh, so, so my entry into optical astronomy what occurred the day after being, no, the evening after being publicly humiliated by Tree at a conference after I had posted a paper with this premise on archive. So I never want to go that route again. <laughs> Which premise? The premise of the controversial or the well, not the premise of not giving people a lo you know a localization at all, but just giving them tiling, but trying to centrally plan, you know what, you, you know what patches should be followed up by which facilities. Um, but I, I mean, I, I I disagree with the premise for the first part as well that that we don't have facilities other than LSST that can tackle. You know, LIGO follow-up. I think that you know ZTF, DECAM, uh, Vista. You know, there are there's a there. I mean, basically, you know, all of the you know wide field, you know, sort of medium depth, you know, synoptic survey facilities that that we already you know partner with. They're all capable. They're all very capable of tackling this problem. Once we get to you know tens to even a hundred square degrees. It just takes a lot more, you know, telescope time. But it's but but at least some of these facilities are willing to devote that time for at least some, you know, you know at least truly bona fide, you know, uh, detections. Yeah, but if Virgo doesn't work, if Vir if Virgo doesn't work, then it then will it'll be extremely challenging. But I think that you know we'll still. Know, many people, m many facilities will still, you know, be happy to try. Tony. Yeah. So on bullet number three, I mentioned yesterday, but it's worth repeating that um, by year two in our survey, twenty twenty four, which is a certain time scale we're thinking about here, uh, there will be full information on three hundred thousand galaxies in every square degree of the footprint. Up to 20,000 square degrees, which means that the full information on 300,000 galaxies out there eventually can create, including the past history of activity. Uh, and their redshift will be known to 0.03 of plus C. So all of that uh, yeah. information is going to uh, be extremely <coughs> useful. Right, yeah. No, that would be great. So, can I ask if there will also be more logical information on the galaxies? Or Oh yes, oh yes. There'll be images of this. Uh, let's see, you wanted to say something before? <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> now we want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, that was in a controversial moment, so maybe it's interesting. Well, one way to solve the problem is that this, this optical community is, observe, is large enough that it will be very difficult to coordinate something, I think. But uh, one way to try to solve the problem is at least on a very short time scale, people should, be, uh, should announce which region they will observe. So there should be a common depository. Good game in theory. which com common depository in which uh, which everybody who has signed an MOU with the with LIGO should 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 at least report I've covered this region with this magnitude with this filters and, and so on. 
this will not help to, this will not be optimal solution, but at least it will give the other groups information. And uh, then one can try to work out if such a common depository exists, then uh, one can even work out uh, an automated program that suggests what is the best next region to, to look at, uh, given that all this region have been covered. So uh, this is halfway between, somewhere between, uh, uh, but th this could be made mandatory. I mean, uh, yeah, we actually. I, I do not it see. Is we, we, did. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. we did. We did. We have a depository, and it's so nominally mandatory. So it's free don't be the prior. Hmm? It's a free don't be the prior. Yeah. So so hmm? then, then one can think about, and I know that some years in another conference that there was presented some program like this, that once you know what you observe, what is the next optimal place to, to look at. So then one one can at the same time this one can send an announcement. Okay the message, where is the next best place to go? So this will be sort of a compromise between forcing people where to look and uh, and just making sure that the whole region is covered. Yeah. So, uh, you cannot prevent people from looking at the best <coughs> galaxy uh, in the first moment that you can, uh, you can but, but at the third and the, <coughs> and, the, and, the, and the fourth exposure, then this is the time to, to force some coordinate or to suggest not force, but to suggest some coordination. So Shri will not be made. <laughs> <laughs> but this is difficult uh, not to get Shri made. Yes. 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 So the only way to do it is this to is go not a controversial it. issue, right? Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, Tony? So on, yeah. uh, on coordination, the reason we set up the science the LSC science collaboration was effectively this. And so there is a science collaboration that addresses this, the interests of all of us in this room. And it's called the Transient Science Collaboration. And they have uh, on their um, uh, timeline uh, this kind of activity. Uh, and so I encourage everybody to get hold of Federico Bianco and Ashish Mahabal. And, um, and it is part of the activity of, of that science, that LSS Science Collaboration. Now, it's, it's, and the reason we set up the science collaboration is because we had a different job to do on the project was to build a machine. And so uh, there are about a thousand members in the science collaboration. So I don't remember how many are in that particular one. It's probably about 200. Mm. Nice, <laughs> nice. Maybe I'll learn. So, Leo? I think that this uh, sort of depository of you know footprints that people have observed is, I mean, uh, useful for sort of the opposite purpose for which it was originally intended. Namely that uh, it's more useful to know that, you know, say as I'm deciding where to point ZTF, uh, I'd like to know that it has some overlap with where PANSTARS or DES has looked so that, um, so that I know that, you know, any, any transient that I find has had, uh, you know, continuous fewer interruptions in you know, photometric monitoring that, you know, there's there's a little bit of variety in what bands have been looked at. And also because I don't necessarily trust, you know, uh, that, you know, the selection, uh, you know, of candidates from, you know, our, you know, machine learning pipeline, and, you know, another facility's machine learning pipeline is going to, I, I don't know, uh, you know, if, if they're, you, you know, I, I think that just having multiple facilities, even in the same bands, looking at the same patch of sky, adds robustness. Um, yeah, okay, so it's, it's, it's a very good point that there are multiple dimensions beyond coverage, but, but you have to take into account. Yeah. So what about, what about the panel? I, I, I see you are very interested in this question. Oh no, I just think it's an interesting psychological question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think like you, cannot, you can bet that we're probably just gonna go after the high confidence events for, um, or sorry, not high confidence regions for, but it depends on the facility. As Leo alluded to, there's some, like GTF has a much larger area, we'll be able to cover hundreds of square degrees pretty easily, whereas dark energy cameras, three square degrees, we're just gonna go after what we can. Also depends on the rising time, the set time of these things. Um, and also another approach is just targeting galaxies, which a lot of people have been doing with smaller and in that way, you're not really necessarily looking at the highest um, confidence 
region, but kind of getting as much stellar mass in there as you can. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, this has already been the, during the PanStars collaboration, but, you know, for instance, yeah, I mean, it's already been, been done in terms of um, being able to produce a, a list of candidates and then many other interested people follow up, you know, just those candidates or, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, another issue is that, you know, there's a, we, we've been talking about all these ways to get, you know, our duty cycle up and, there, and all these factors of, you know, 10 or 50 percent and, you know, in, you know, bumping up the rate, but, you know, the one uh, thing that we haven't talked about is, is the, the issue that we, there's only one LSST, we only have the southern hemisphere. We, there's nothing comparable in the northern hemisphere. You also just to build another? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, only we need that. Like Nobody <laughs> else needs the northern one, yeah? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we'll, you know, we'll know a lot about the southern sky, but we, you know, it'd be, it's always, it, it would all be, always be nice to do it. I mean, SDSS was amazing, of course, but, you know, there's, uh, you know, it only covered the northern sky, and so there are certain things that are more painful to do. There are certain types of analysis, certain types of follow-up that are more painful to do in the southern sky, because there wasn't a you know, copy of it. So, yeah. so I guess t Tony very carefully considered this. Yes. <laughs> yeah. He's decision. writing now the NSF proposal. <laughs> yeah. So, so maybe you wanted to say something. Oh yeah, I just want to follow up. I mean, we had a situation with one of the follow-ups where uh, a minor planet had gotten through one of our um, machine learnings, and it was just you know it was a it was a silly thing, but uh, it might, maybe it was ETF or something that sort of clarified that one of our, the transients we had put out just being worth you know, spending some big telescope time on was quickly realized to not be. And so we've already found value in covering um, the same sky areas. Uh, you know, At Atlas and Pan Stars, we do our best to put out transients within a day or so, uh, kind of the, the day after, essentially. And uh, we found great benefit to having other facilities looking at the transients you know, clarifying things for us or vice versa. So I think to some extent there has been, I realize there's not been like telescope coordination, but there hasn't, I also haven't seen people actively um, trying to harm them, or you know, in some sense, right? We, we've only been better. So he just voiced the thought that it's been coming uh, very often after all this discussion. Do you have a, um, something uh, tangible in mind after the end of this meeting? Do you, as far as coordination is concerned? In fact, yes, yes, yes. yes. So we'll, we'll talk about, you, you're going to leave soon, right? So yes. we'll not be here for that. Yeah, but we do have this plan. Uh, before that, we'll need to squeeze in a lot of things. But so we want to discuss what's next, how to organize the, the community, essentially. So right. that's the idea. That's the reason we organize this workshop, but for I the most part, because we need this. Yeah, yeah. Well. We just need to write it down. Yeah, yeah. We need to write it down. Yeah. We'll keep you in the loop. Thanks. Um, so, we'll check. Yeah, we why don't we get always the really general questions? Like, what are your worries? What's your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> because, because, because I don't want to give anything into your mouth. I want to, I want to hear you. <laughs> Can I say something? This, this no, 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 it's a little bit connected to the last panel, but yeah, I think oh, I know. in this current, I mean, so the, so this current era where we're getting the first events and they're nearby and we think optically they may be very dim, we need LSST. Uh, we don't necessarily, we, we need LSST something very deep. I mean, we think these things are dim. We don't know. If we're on axis, we may get lucky. I think as time goes on, if we do upgrade advanced LIGO, we do move on to Einstein Telescope where we can see mergers out to redshift of a half. Um, and then, you know, at a redshift of a half, I don't think we'll ever detect a kill them. I'm not sure, but it'll be really, really hard. I think there, then, you know, the gamma ray bursts are going to start to become more and more relevant uh, uh, because, in a sense, you know, when Fei showed, we, we see, you know, several gamma ray bursts per year in that volume. Um, so I think the role, I think, you know, in terms of thinking long term, um, you know, depending on the time frame for some of these upgrades, you know, we may need to be thinking about these high energy satellites now uh, as, as having, you know, basically having this capability in place. Um, 
you know, in, in the era where maybe, you know, these things are too far away to, to detect off axis, but we can still, we, we already are detecting them in scan ray bursts. So that's just sort of throwing it out there that, you know, as you think about these, these short term missions to connect to trans LIGO, but we should also be thinking about what is going to be the gamma ray burst satellite of the 2020s and 2030s that can do what SWIFT does, maybe all sky, maybe better uh, in different ways. Or, or whether we have access to the data because it might not be American. Right, 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 yeah, 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 yeah right, right, right. <laughs> and that's very important. I just think they're going to become more and more relevant. Okay, so I guess I guess we are under time pressure because planes leave and the TSA doesn't wait for anybody. So thank you very much for this. Yeah, thank you, and so so um, Tony will have a slightly less time.